Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jotir Gamaya Brutyur Ma Brutam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from death to immortality, 
Om, peace, peace, peace be unto us, peace be unto all. Friends, on this Christmas Eve day, we are all assembled here to offer our adoration to Jesus the Christ, whom we worship as an incarnation of God. The Bhagavad Gita says that whenever virtue is on the decline and vice is on the ascent, that supreme reality embodies itself and comes to this earth to teach us how to grow in God consciousness. In Sanskrit, the word for incarnation is avatara. Avatara means one who has come down, one who has descended. Descended from where? The ultimate reality, it transcends space, time and causality. So there is nowhere where that ultimate reality is not. So descending means this, that ultimate reality, free from all attributes, no name, no form, but that one spiritual essence behind this universe of names and forms assumes a human form. That means it, has, it assumes for itself a human mind, a human form. It can assume any form, but it assumes, it assumes a human form. That means it, it uh, willingly associates itself with a mind, a body. An association that entails suffering, Sri Ramakrishna says, Brahman, when it assumes a human body, it, 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 it has to undergo suffering. Suffering is inevitable in embodiment when we have a body and mind. So that is effectively coming down from that state of uh, oneness to being associated with body, mind and senses. That's an act of supreme compassion by that ultimate reality. Why should it do that? We saw that it does. It does it, it, it embodies itself when virtue is on the decline, dharma is on the decline, and adharma, vice, is on the ascent. But what is it for us? That supreme reality comes down to teach us how to ascend. It descends from its state of oneness to teach us how to ascend from a state of perpetual body consciousness to the state of divine consciousness. That is why avatara means one who has descended. Avatarana is descension. And that coming down is to teach us humanity how to go up in God consciousness, how to grow in devotion to God, who abides in the hearts of all beings. And as we grow in devotion to God, who abides in our hearts, we grow in detachment from our body, mind and senses. And of course, from everything outside of us, everything that we perceive. What is the significance of Christmas in the Ramakrishna order? We observe, we observe this day in all our centers, not only here, but also all over the world. Sri Ramakrishna <coughs> abided in a state of divine state of Christ consciousness for three days when the picture of Mother Mary holding baby Jesus in her arms in Jadu Malik's garden house. Jadu Malik was an aristocrat who lived outside of the temple complex, Dakshineshu temple complex. So Sri Ramakrishna visited him and that picture, it was just a painting. It is just a, just a painting because that painting is there today in the Vedanta Society of Northern California, San Francisco. It is there in the monastery on the wall adjacent to the landing. So that painting which Sri Ramakrishna witnessed, it is quite a big painting. When Sri Ramakrishna saw that painting, it, it animated with life. It is, it is not some kind of an imagination which could happen to us. But Christ became living and he entered into him. Christ entered into Sri Ramakrishna. And Sri Ramakrishna was in that Christ consciousness for three full days. He did not go to the, the Kali temple. 
or any other temples in that uh, the temple complex he was immersed in that Christ consciousness one specialty of Sri Ramakrishna's advent is that he attained perfection through all paths in Hinduism and also through Christianity and Islam so everyone who came to him long before the disciples came to him his would-be monastic disciples came to him in 1881 Many people came of different denominations, worshippers of uh, Shiva, worshippers of Vishnu, of Shakti, Christians, Muslims, sincere seekers who came to him saw in him the fulfillment of their own ideal. Christians who saw Sri Ramakrishna looked upon him as Christ himself. So Sri Ramakrishna was in that consciousness for three full days. He had two disciples monastic disciples, Shashi and Sharat, who later became Swami Ramakrishnananda and Swami Saradananda. These two Sri Ramakrishna looked upon as companions of Jesus Christ in their former incarnation. And these two disciples' grasp of the Bible was something extraordinary. And when later, after Sri Ramakrishna's passing, when one of these disciples had a chance to discuss the Bible with some, <coughs> some Christian eminent person, the other person was amazed at this Swami's grasp of the Bible and expressed himself so. And the Swami said, we lived with a person who was Christ himself. So that's about Shashi and Sharat. Swami Ramakrishnananda, the founder of the Ramakrishna movement in southern India, and Sharat Swami Sharadananda, the first general secretary of the order. After Sri Ramakrishna's passing, Swami Vivekananda and his brother disciples, most of them, they had assembled in a place called Artpur. Artpur is a place of birth of Swami Premananda, Babura Maharaj. So they all assembled there and one evening they lit what is called Duni. Duni means they, they set fire to a few logs and sit around that fire and meditate. So Swami Vivekananda and his disciples were meditating and after meditating for some time, Swami Vivekananda spoke in glowing words of Jesus' renunciation and they resolved then and there that they would take the monastic life. They are not going to be just uh, going to continue as <coughs> lay people. So Swami Vivekananda spoke to them about Jesus' renunciation. Without any calculation, it was spontaneous on his part. And everyone felt uplifted. <coughs> and they discovered at the end of it all that it was Christmas Eve. Swamiji did not give a lecture to his brother disciples being conscious that it was Christmas Eve, the Supreme Reality spoke through Swami Vivekananda. So, Christ is adored as an incarnation of God in the Ramakrishna order. We offer Him worship as such. Offerings are made in Belurmut, of course, during pre-pandemic days. You would witness a huge congregation in the temple and many Many sweet preparations, delicacies would be offered to, offered to Jesus, puja would be performed to him, carols will be sung. So we offer adoration to him as the Son of God, as one of the incarnations of God. <coughs> now we'll reflect on some teachings of <coughs> Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ taught about the Spirit, the divinity that we truly are not the body-mind complex with which we remain identified most of the time. He taught about the spirit, about God, and not of the world. He spoke of renunciation. The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath, hath nowhere to lay his head. He taught of renunciation. He taught renunciation of selfishness of attachment to our ego and possessions. A young man asked, Jesus, 
Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven. And come, take up thy cross, and follow me. And then he says, Whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Lose his life means life of attachment to objects in the world. Whosoever renounces this life of attachment to objects in the world, living and non-living, will find it. Find what? Find eternal life. Find immortality. And when we are on the topic of renunciation, we remind ourselves as spiritual seekers that we don't give up anything for nothing. We always give up we always give up the lower things for something higher. We give up lower kinds of happiness, happiness that stems from the organic level of our being, the body mind, the body especially, the five senses, the ears, the skin, the eyes, the tongue and the nose. Joy that comes from through these organs you call it sense enjoyment, what Sri Krishna calls rajasic happiness, which always alternates with misery. It deprives us of the power of discrimination and leads to spiritual ruin. So, what Jesus Christ, Christ taught was renunciation, renunciation of something lower for something higher. We give up lower forms of happiness to taste higher forms of happiness. If there is happiness and sense enjoyment, there is a superior kind of happiness in self-mastery, in having the mind under our control, in having the senses under our control. When we grow in self-mastery, we grow in st we grow strong in will, we grow in devotion to God. And that joy is called Shama Sukha. Shama is self-control. Sukha is happiness. Vishaya Sukha. Vishaya means objects of the world. The joy that comes from by enjoying objects of the world is called Vishaya Sukha, superior to which is Shama Sukha, the joy of self-control. The joy of self the, the, the joy of self-mastery, having the mind and senses under control. In the language of the Katopanishad, when the charioteer is wide awake, with the reins held firmly in his hands, the other end of the reins being fixed to five horses, which are well trained. The horses are well trained, the charioteer is wide awake. He can steer the chariot to the destination. He can steer the chariot to where the master of the chariot wants to go. The master of the chariot is the Atman, what we truly are. The charioteer is Buddhi, the seat of will, the seat of the will. The reins are compared to the mind. And the five horses are compared to the five sense organs. So here, as long as the charioteer is wide awake, the chariot, the chariot cannot be taken for a ride by one of the most powerful, one of the five powerful horses. So the horses are, the horses are broken in, the charioteer is wide awake, the chariot will reach the destination. The chariot is human body. So the Upanishad says, when your senses are under control and your will is strong, your buddhi is wide awake, that means you are wide awake with respect to your mind, body and senses, you will reach the supreme goal of life, which is God consciousness. So, we are talking about shamasukha, the joy of self-control, abiding as an entity superior to body, mind and senses. Now we'll reflect on the teachings of Jesus Christ, which are under Sermon on the Mount. We read, Jesus taught the multitudes according to their capacity, but his teachings given through the Sermon on the Mount were reserved for his disciples and for those who were spiritually ready. An incarnation of God comes not only for some elite few, he comes for everyone. He has a message for everyone. And not everyone has equal receptivity. Jesus had his core disciples. He had the multitudes to teach. Sri Ramakrishna. He had devoted householders as his disciples. People who came to him on Sundays and other holidays. To whom Sri Ramakrishna 
give teachings that will help them evolve spiritually. And Sri Ramakrishna trained his would-be monastic disciples, 16 of them, in a special way because they were going to bear his torch. They were going to be the pillars of the Ramakrishna order, Ramakrishna Mutt and Ramakrishna Mission. So when an incarnation of God comes, he comes for everyone and his teachings are not exclusive. In Sri Ramakrishna's language, all jackals howl alike. A true incarnation of God, his teachings will not unsettle your understanding. So, we'll reflect on some of Jesus' teachings. So he taught the multitudes according to their capacity, then came the time for him to teach his select few. And we read, and seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and then the teaching continues. You find something similar in Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna taught his householder disciples. As we saw, when they visited him, visited him, visited him on holidays, Sundays and other holidays. But when he taught his monastic disciples, speaking fiery words of renunciation, he would make sure that there was no one around. Because your teaching should not unsettle someone else. So when he had his disciples, would-be monastic disciples, he would see that the doors are closed, make sure that no one else was around, and speak to them burning words of renunciation. He was longing for these people to come to him, these would-be monastic disciples to come to him. He had seen so many people, aspirants of different kinds, or people who came to him out of curiosity. He was fed up with all this. At the end of the day, in the evening, he would climb the terrace of the building <coughs> called Kuti, <coughs> adjacent to his, the room where he lived, <coughs> and cry in anguish, Oh children, where you are, please come, because the Divine Mother had revealed to him that his would-be disciples would come to him, people who could assimilate his teachings on purity and renunciation of lust and gold. So Sri Ramakrishna was impatient. He would, he would say, where are you? Please come. And they started coming one by one. Swami Vivekananda Narendra was the leader among them. Sri Ramakrishna also saw some lay disciples like M, the author of the gospel. Their coming also was revealed to him beforehand. Balram Bose. M. Mahindranath Gupta. So he taught his monastic disciples in a particular way. The teachings that go by Sermon on the Mount can inspire every sincere spiritual seeker. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus Christ lays down conditions for discipleship and he teaches the way, ways and means for attaining purity of mind, so that the truth of God may be re revealed in our hearts. Jesus Christ said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as the Father, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. This is the central theme of the Sermon on the Mount. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. If the Father in heaven is perfect, you too can attain to perfection. That means you can grow in God consciousness. You could discover the God that is within you. Every religion teaches the need to seek perfection. And this perfection is divine perfection, not perfection in the world outside, not uh, academic accomplishment or attaining worldly prosperity, but this is inner perfection realizing our true nature, which transcends time, space, and causality. There is the absolute reality which dwells in the hearts of all beings, and that's a state of fulfillment and abiding peace. Worldly perfection does not bring fulfillment, but a sense of lack accompanied by frustration. And worldly happiness always alternates with misery. Only divine perfection leads to unalloyed bliss, what Vedanta calls ananda, sat chit ananda, sat, 
existence absolute, chit knowledge absolute or consciousness absolute, and ananda bliss absolute. And where to find this God? How to attain this perfection? Vedanta teaches that God abides in the hearts of all beings as consciousness. Jesus Christ says in the Gospel according to Saint Luke, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of, the kingdom of God is within you. <coughs> it's within us. It's not spatially somewhere else, but it is within us. But we are not aware of this divinity because we are associated with our body, mind and senses and as a sequel associated with people outside of us, possessions outside of us. Vedanta calls this ignorance. Ignorance of the fact that we are the spirit, we are divine beings. Because of ignorance, we resist the idea that God realization is possible in this life. Jesus Christ says, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. He didn't say in a postmortem existence. Ye shall know the truth. If you know the truth, the truth will make you free here and now. Which is what Vedanta says. And Christ emphasizes devotion. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and all thy mind. The person who realizes this non-dual reality, non-dual truth, effectively enters into the kingdom of God. Again, not a kingdom spatially, but he enters into himself, becomes one with the divinity, and he becomes perfect, even as the Father in heaven is perfect. Now the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes speak of blessedness. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What is this blessing? What is this blessedness? This blessedness is a state different from attaining earthly blessings. It means a condition in which the spirit of God enters the heart of man when he is no longer of the world, but he is transformed into a divine being. Jesus Christ says, the most important of the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. God is seated in our heart. Divinity is inherent in us. In Swami Vivekananda's words, we are all potentially divine. As long as we are not aware that we are divine beings, we are potentially divine. And what is potential can manifest itself. When we, are, when we realize that we are divine, that potential divinity has manifested itself and we become one with the divinity. That is what is spiritual life about. That we are divine, we are ignorant about it because of impurities, impurities in the mind. And what are the physical impurities easy to understand, but what are these impurities? These impurities are the impressions we have gathered by your thoughts and actions, which dictate our behavior at the mental level, at the physical level. We are, we are governed by our impressions. Each one of us is of a different nature. Each one of us faces identical situations in different ways. All that is because of the difference in their, the sum total of their impressions, difference in their characters. So purity, purity is a subject by itself. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The Bhagavad Gita says purity is synonymous with knowledge with a capital K, by knowing which everything becomes known. Nahi jnanena sadrasham pavitram iha vidyate. There is nothing more purifying than knowledge. So purity is knowledge with a capital K. Purity is God. So as we grow in purity, that means as we grow in devotion to God, as we grow in proximity to God, we are able to experience this blessedness. And what is a sure test of purity, that we are growing in purity? When we grow in purity, thoughts of God arise spontaneously in our mind. We don't struggle to think of God. We don't struggle to focus on a divine name and on a divine form to the exclusion of everything else. In the midst of uh, a vortex of thoughts, in the midst of stiff resistance from the mind, but 
we eagerly look forward to our meditation we eagerly look forward to <coughs> repeating the holy name the mantra and the mind has become a will the, the the mind has become a willing participant when it grows in purity we have grown in detachment that's a very important point to keep in mind as we grow in purity of mind we grow in detachment from it we grow in self mastery over it we grow in detachment from our body senses mind and of course from everything outside of us that is what is purity so blessed are the pure in heart pure in mind both of which are synonymous here purity of heart and purity of mind our mind need not manufacture a question what is the distinction between the two both are the same heart and mind here refer to the same thing so this teaching emphasizes the need to cleanse ourselves of the impurities in our heart or mind by thinking more and more of god how to get rid of physical how to get rid of physical impurity we understand we can wash ourselves we can get rid of physical impurity but these mental impurities the more we grow toward god the more we grow in devotion to god the purer becomes the mind and the stronger do we become we grow in devotion to god we become more inward directed the mind is not the mind and the senses are not outward directed pursuing the objects they want anymore but they have learned discipline the senses merge in the mind i grow in detachment from the mind i grow in devotion to god within that is what is purity <coughs> shri ram krishna would say everyone may have an undesirable past if you think you've done something bad shri ram krishna say that's no excuse for you to to think of that belittle yourselves who oh, i cannot do this i am a weakling i am a sinner shri ram krishna says granted that you have done something bad pray to god enter into a pact with him oh god i have done something bad but i won't repeat it and continue shri ram krishna have faith in the divine name the mantra the mantra the divine name signifies a divine form both of which are inseparable god and his name are inseparable the mantra and the deity is signified by the mantra they are one and the same we are aware of the mantra but the deity is still unknown to us so shri ram krishna says have faith in the divine name have faith in its transforming power have faith in its capacity to take you close to god and make you grow in detachment from everything that is ungodly so shri ram krishna says there is no excuse for you to dwell on your under undesirable past demean yourself belittle yourself but stay focused on the present have faith in the divine name and you have entered into a pact with god i won't repeat it and shri ram krishna says god listens to your prayer provided it is sincere not repeating what we consider to be bad is is part of being sincere we cannot afford to live the same old life prompted by desires in the mind led by the mind and the senses to pursue objects outside and still hope to grow in devotion grow in purity but we need to take care of our end of the bargain the pact that we entered with god i have done something bad but i won't repeat it trying sincerely not to repeat what we consider to be bad is part of being sincere and such people will certainly find that god is responsive shri ram krishna always says god certainly listens to your prayer but you got to be sincere and earnest and shri ram krishna says purify your body mind and the tongue by chanting his name and he assures us <coughs> that sins untold number of sins are impressions in the language of vedanta that we have in the mind bad impressions we don't need to be deterred by them shri ramakrishna says a room that, a room that has been dark for thousands of years that doesn't take long to light up strike a match thousands of years of darkness vanishes in a moment so he says god's grace will redeem even the worst sinner we need to have faith in god's name and repeat his name in a prayerful attitude and the world will automatically recede from us what is required is 
to be sincere and be earnest to know the truth know the truth so the more we proceed the more we proceed toward the light the light of all lights who abides his consciousness in our hearts the more darkness of ignorance recedes from us the next beatitude blessed are they who do who do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled now righteousness here means absolute righteousness which means that supreme reality not just morality usually by righteousness we understand morality but here righteousness means that supreme righteousness that means that state of abundance in god hunger and thirst blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness hunger and thirst that hunger is called vyakulata or longing for god yearning for god which shri ramakrishna considers an important quality for a spiritual seeker when he is on the path of devotion he says you could repeat the divine name for years together yet not make any progress because of the lack of this one thing vyakulata longing for god when you don't have that longing for god love for god yearning that earnestness spiritual practice becomes just a ritual it is more of a chore so hunger and thirst both these signify yearning for god the desire to know the truth yearning to be one with god's will that is the true implication of uh, righteousness shri ramakrishna says he illustrates this yearning with an example this yearning like is like a clerk who lost his job he goes to the same company every day day after day to inquire if there is any vac- vacancy with great longing he goes so longing is that so blessed are they which hunger after thirst hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled they shall be filled with god consciousness the third beatitude blessed are they that mourn <coughs> they will be comforted this mourning <coughs> is different from mourning for pleasures and possessions this blessed mourning <coughs> is again related to yearning for god this results from spiritual loneliness or spiritual loss or that discontinuity in god vision separation from god such mourning is characterized by characterized by a powerful yearning <coughs> welling up in the heart shri ramakrishna says people shed jug full of tears for their wife for their children for their possessions who weeps for god shri ramakrishna says weep to god shed tears before him in prayer and that will take you closer to god so this teaching says blessed are they that mourn <coughs> they will be comforted they will be comforted by more of devotion to god and proximity to god it is because <coughs> such people are comforted that there is prosperity in the world spiritual prosperity in the world and despite so much of unrighteousness that characterizes life in the world by many people there are still spiritual seekers because they are assured of this being comforted by god being comforted by vision of god in vedanta we have three schools three schools of philosophy dvaita dualism vishishta dvaita qualified non dualism and advaita non dualism and every incarnation of god teaches people to suit their temperaments not the same set of teachings for everyone as we saw before he, jesus christ taught his disciples in a particular way would be disciples the torch bearers of his message he taught the multitudes according to their capacity so did shri ramakrishna his teachings differed from people to people so to the masses who could not grasp anything higher than a personal god 
Jesus Christ taught, pray to your Father in heaven. The simple prayer, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, etc. So this is a simple prayer he taught to the multitude, and this, this took them to God. If a person sincerely repeated this prayer, you have a beautiful book, The Way of a Pilgrim, and the pilgrim continues his way, which speaks of a Russian peasant who was just repeating simply this inner prayer, inward prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. You cannot read that book without doing japa yourself, The Way of a Pilgrim. And so this shows he was just a peasant, so no qualifications needed, no scholarship is needed. All that is required is that yearning for God. So that inner prayer Jesus taught to the multitude, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, have mercy on me, etc. That is dualism. God is different from me. I and God are different. To others who could grasp a higher teaching, he said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Vine and the branches. So bran the branches are part of the vine. So, and Jesus Christ continues, He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. <coughs> I am the whole, you are the part. Guard the antaryami. Antaryami means inner controller. You have a section devoted to this antaryami brahmanam in the Brahadarandika Upanishad. He who abides in this earth, who is different from earth, who's, who forms the core of this earth, whom the earth does not know, he is that antaryami, and so on. It speaks of uh, earth, everything in this world, and human beings also. So that is antaryami means that inner controller, God who presides over our body, mind, and senses. <coughs> God is the whole, we are the part. This body is the whole, hands are parts, feet are parts, other parts of the body are parts. Similarly, if God can be imagined to be this whole body, we are like hands, feet, or other parts of the body, which you can still call the body. When you touch any part of the body, you say you have touched the body. You don't say I have touched only the hand. Similarly, we are parts of God, God the divine fire, and we are sparks of that fire. That is Vishishta Advaita. Vishishta means special, qualified, Advaita, non-dualism. That means God is the spirit, we are also the spirit, but until we attain union with God, the spirit that I am, which is detached from body, mind and senses, which is a spark of the divine fire within, the spark yearns for union with that fire within. That is what is Vishishtha Advaita. So Jesus Christ said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, he can do nothing. And to the select few, his disciples, who could receive the highest teaching, non-duality, Advaita, Jesus Christ taught, I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. <coughs> no, that again uh, belongs to Vishishta Advaita. I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. So to, to the disciples to whom he revealed himself more fully, he proclaimed the highest truth, I and my Father are one. That is Advaita. So we find, we find in his teachings, teachings fit for seekers of different levels of evolution. First, prayer to Father in heaven, God and I are different. Next, I am part of God, God is whole and I am, a, I am his part. And finally, I and my Father are one. So these, these are teachings that uh, lend themselves a lot of reflection. And the most important of the Beatitudes was this, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So this is an occasion for us, today is an occasion for us to reflect on these teachings and grow in devotion to God, the God that we worship. Because the yearning for God, yearning for God consciousness is common to everyone, whatever be the pathway they follow. Thank you. We'll have some more musical offering.
in a lowly manger, the humble Christ was born and brought us God's salvation. That blessed Christmas morn. On the mountain, over the hills and everywhere, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Sing, let us sing. Mountain over the hills and everywhere, go silent on the mountain where Jesus Christ is born. The day after tomorrow, December 26th, Sunday, 11 a.m., we have a special service to celebrate Holy Mother Sri Sharada Devi's birthday. We'll have swinging, singing by our choir, followed by a lecture, The Eternal Mother, followed by more singing. I'd welcome all of you to that special service also. And every Tuesday and Friday, <coughs> 8 o'clock in the evening, we have a study class that begins with a period of meditation. Tuesdays, we study the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, and Fridays, the Atma Bodha. We just uh, began our study last week, so the second class will be held next Friday evening at 8 o'clock. So I welcome you to these, uh, all these programs. And before we say a concluding prayer, uh, I would request all of you to collect uh, a sweet prasad as you leave the chapel. And uh, yes, I would once again welcome you to, to attend the day after tomorrow's program. <coughs> now concluding prayer. May the supreme reality who is the Father in Heaven of the Christians, the Holy One of the Jewish faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Chinese faith, the Great Spirit of the Native Americans, Ahura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the all-loving being manifest himself unto us and grant us abiding understanding and all-consuming divine love. Om, peace, peace, peace be unto us, peace be unto all. So greetings and Merry Christmas to all of you. <coughs>